I'd like to invite everyone to take their seats so that we can begin our program. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so glad that you're here for this first of a series of lectures on the Jewish tradition and human rights. I'm Eric Myers, director of the Center for Jewish Studies and professor in the Department of Religion. Welcome. This is the first lecture in a continuing series on human rights in the Jewish tradition that will stretch over a period of two years, culminating with the dedication of the Rubenstein Library's holdings on the papers and archives of Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, noted Jewish theologian and civil rights activist. Together with Rabbi Marshall T. Meyer Holdings, especially his papers regarding his opposition to the dirty war in Argentina and his human rights activities there in behalf of the wrongfully imprisoned and disappeared, this collection demonstrates more than words the nobility of the human spirit to act in behalf of others in need, even at the risk of their own lives. The organizers of this series believe that human rights is one of the core issues facing the world today. And by examining the Jewish tradition, we hope to show how it can inform and illuminate this important subject. The Center for Jewish Studies and the Center for Human Rights at Duke and its director, Robin Kirk, are pleased to join hands in this undertaking and have the Freeman Center for Jewish Life support it along with the Department of Religion. In this academic year, 013-14, the series will focus on the four main periods of Jewish history, beginning with the biblical history today. The next lecture in this series will be given by Professor Eviata Marienberg on December 2nd at this time and in this very place, the subject, The Rabbis and Human Rights, the Ancient Period. On February 3rd, also here at this time and place, Kalman Bland, our own Kalman Bland from Duke, Medieval Jewish Perspectives on Human Rights. And then our concluding lecture on April 7th will be delivered by Professor Zachary Braderman from Syracuse University, What's Human? Who's Right? Moses Mendelssohn and the Jewish Enlightenment. Next year's program, we hope, will be more topically oriented to coincide with the opening of the Rubenstein Library Collection on Human Rights. It's my pleasure now to introduce Professor Carol Myers, who will introduce the speaker. Thank you, Professor Eric Myers. <laughs> it's a pleasure to introduce this speaker since he and I share uh, some graduate training, although we didn't overlap. I'm a little bit younger than he is. Uh, if I were to tell you that Mark Brettler is the Dora Golding Professor of Biblical Studies at Brandeis University, you would know that he teaches, that he has a prestigious position that he teaches at a leading New England university, and that he's a specialist in biblical studies. But you would not, from that title, grasp either the range of his scholarly interests or the fact that his erudition has had an impact well beyond the academy. And I'll say a little more about those two features in a moment, but I first want to just give you a very, very brief overview of his distinguished career. Professor Brettler discovered academic biblical study in college at Brandeis, where he earned the BA magna cum laude, and then stayed there for the MA and PhD, all three degrees in the Department of Near Eastern and Judaic Studies. He joined the faculty of Brandeis immediately upon receiving his doctorate in 1986, and he's taught there ever since, except for brief stints as a visiting professor at Middlebury College, Brown University, Yale University, and also the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. He's an extremely prolific scholar. 
He also finds time to be involved in civic and religious affairs, to be featured on radio and television programs discussing biblical subjects, and to serve on numerous editorial boards and university committees, and also to hold positions in several scholarly organizations. Now those two features, first the range of his scholarship. Here's just a sample. Professor Brettler has done pioneering work on the use of metaphor in the Hebrew Bible, with his book on God as King, on that metaphor, becoming a model for the study of biblical metaphors. He has also written several books and many articles exploring the nature of biblical texts as both historical and literary productions. He considers what or tries to figure out what the biblical writers were interested in conveying when they wrote about the past and how they use literary forms to shape their ideas and express their ideas. Professor Brettler has also written a grammar of biblical Hebrew, a very special kind of grammar. I don't think you're using it in your Hebrew classes here. It's one geared to students who begin their study of Hebrew by first learning modern Hebrew. And he has also written, I'm pleased to say, a number of articles on women and the Hebrew Bible, including one that I really like called On Becoming a Male Feminist Biblical Scholar. Professor Brettler's work is especially significant because of the second feature. It reaches far beyond the academy. He has written, co-written, or co-edited several highly acclaimed books that seek to bridge the gap between the discoveries of biblical scholarship and the needs of contemporary Bible readers and religious communities. And I think that attempting to bridge that gap is something that many of us think about and are facing. One of these books is an introductory text, How to Read the Bible, which has been published in Hebrew as well as in English and is used widely not only on campuses but in adult education. Another is his co-authored The Bible and the Believer, which shows how the Bible can be both a literary and historical text as well as sacred scripture. Then there are his co-edited works, including the Jewish Study Bible and most recently the Jewish Annotated New Testament which he did with Professor A.J. Levine, whom probably many of you know if you're mostly first-year students, I don't know, but she, was, she spoke here last year. All these books are both erudite and highly readable, and they are also unfailingly sensitive to the religious sensibilities of the reader. And the same is true for the remarkable new website called the Torah, a historical and contextual approach, also known as Torah.com. That, and Professor Brettler is the co-founder of that new website. So it's Professor Brettler's excellence in both scholarship and teaching that has earned him a number of awards and honors. Most recent is his election to the American Academy for Jewish Research, which is the oldest professional organization of Judaic studies in America. And this excellence in both scholarship and teaching is what prompted us to invite Professor Brettler to give today's lecture on the Hebrew Bible and human rights. Mark. Thank you very much for that very, very generous introduction and for inviting me to speak early this evening before Boston wins game five of the World Series. For, sev for several reasons, I'm very honored to inaugurate this lecture series. In the past few years, the Bible has again become more important in American public discourse. And I've been writing about the Bible in American public life. And this talk has forced me to consider this issue more systematically. Also, I'm a long-term admirer of the scholarly work and social activism of A.J. Heschel, and it is an honor to be associated with him. I use this occasion to review some of his writings on human rights, especially his book, The Insecurity of Freedom, Essays on Human Existence, and have found them very moving. To help frame my talk, I would like to begin with two quotations from his essay, Religion and Race. How many disasters do we have to go through in order to realize that all of humanity has a stake in the liberty of one person. Whenever one person is offended, we are all hurt. 
What begins as an equality of some inevitably ends as an equality of all. And who shall plead for the helpless? Who shall prevent the epidemic of injustice that no court of justice is capable of stopping? Heschel's words ring as true now as they were when they were first offered 50 years ago as the opening address at the National Conference on Religion and Race in Chicago. I'm somewhat embarrassed to admit that I had never heard of Rabbi Marshall Meyer before being invited here. After all, as a Bible scholar, I primarily deal with those who have been dead for two millennia, if indeed they ever existed at all. <laughs> Professor Meyer early, earlier introduced the importance of his uncle, Rabbi Meyer, but, and did not elaborate. I would like to flesh out his description by quoting two brief passages from Marshall Meyer's words as collected in the book, You Are My Witness. Either God created us or we created him. All of us act as if we created him, as if he is in our pocket and we know exactly what he wants. For so many people, he is only interested in Jews. And if God is only interested in Jews, as naive and as complicated as it may sound, by definition, he cannot be God. As a rabbi, still him, I felt obligated to visit prison and to try to comfort parents of the disappeared people, be they Christian, Jew, or agnostic. Why? Behind what little I have done in human rights, such an endless task, there was and is one basic idea. If we are to take the prophets seriously, we cannot negate history. The problems are ours because Amos, Isaiah, and Hosea taught us that they are ours, taught us that there is only one mankind as there is only one God. Why should so few have so much and so many starve? This is a Jewish question. This is a biblical question. I bleed with people when I see them hungry and crawling for safety. I wish I could be as eloquent as Rabbi Meyer, but my main question derives directly from his last quotation. To what extent is human rights a biblical question? Before I get to the biblical texts, I'd like to introduce three caveats. First, I teach the Bible, I love the Bible, but do not believe that the Bible is perfect. The Bible is not always going to come out so great this afternoon, but I feel I must be honest. I will talk very briefly about the implications of the Bible's middling human rights issue record at the very end. Secondly, this whole talk and much of this lecture series is anachronistic. The term human rights did not exist until the 18th century. Human rights are enshrined in the U.S. Declaration of Independence and the French Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen of 1789. Then they became less important for a while until in the aftermath of World War II, they gained more importance, with, especially with the 1948 UN-sponsored Universal Declaration of Human Rights which is the contemporary human rights document to which I will refer often. Thus, looking at the Bible from hum a human rights perspective is fundamentally anachronistic. And usually, as a historical critical biblical scholar, I condemn anachronism. But anachronism isn't evil, as long as we are aware that we are engaging in it. And it is fair, I think, to ask where any society ancient, medieval, early modern, or contemporary stands in relation to current notions of human rights. At the same time, and this relates to my immediately preceding point, it is unfair to criticize earlier societies too harshly for not upholding an idea that did not yet exist. Stated differently, biblical Israel obviously was not a signatory to the 1948 United Nations Agreement. Third, I'm a critical, or better, a contextual biblical scholar, and I study the Bible as a complex and composite ancient Near Eastern text. 
And as such, I believe that the Bible is not monolithic about almost anything and may be interpreted without recourse to later interpretation. There will be another talk on human rights and classical rabbinic thought, and then lectures on the medieval and modern periods. And I hope that these will, in conjunction with my talk, allow people to see changes in human rights situation in Judaism over time, and if the human rights situation got better or worse. As a critical or contextual biblical scholar, my main concern is what various biblical texts from different periods and times meant. As a committed Jew, however, I am not limited by what these ancient texts once meant. Now to the topic itself. You might think that I should suffice with the impassioned remarks of Rabbis Heschel and Meyer about the prophets in civil rights and sit down, since the issue is settled. The Bible is the greatest advocate for human rights prior to 1776. But it is not so simple. The prophetic voice, or better, prophetic voices, are part of the biblical picture, but not the entire biblical picture. Texts such as Amos 5.24, the Gal Kamai Mishpat, but let justice well up like water, righteousness like an unfailing stream, embedded in Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, which we must celebrate on its 50th anniversary, are only a small part of the prophetic legacy. There are not many prophetic texts that are critical of the political social status quo one biblical scholar estimates that at most, such passages measured generously comprise 11% of the prophetic corpus. We cannot say that they represent all prophecy and certainly not the entire Hebrew Bible. In the words of that study, contrary to what is commonly thought, the ethics and morality of Israel's social behavior were not major concerns of these prophets. That study furthermore notes that only rarely did prophets do more than call these problems to people's attention. They, they rarely suggested how such problems might be mitigated. We must also remember that there are many contra contravailing prophetic texts as well, which do emphasize right, R-I-T-E, over right, R-I-G-H-T, to use the wordplay popularized by Shalom Spiegel. There is another problem, even more basic, in my taking such texts as Isaiah 524 or Isaiah 1, which I'll get to in a moment, as human right texts. As far as I can tell, the audience of all of these prophecies was Israelite, and these prophetic texts address behavior within the ancient Israelite community. For example, the famous Isaiah 1 text, which concludes most beautifully, wash yourselves clean, put your evil doings away from my sight, cease to do evil, learn to do good, devote yourself to justice, aid the wronged, uphold the rights of the orphan, defend the cause of the widow, is preceded by a section that discusses the lack of value of sacrifices, temple worship, prayer and festivals that the Israelites engaged in. The theme of the passage is that such worship is worthless unless the Israelites properly treat their fellow Israelites. Stated differently, and this will become a crucial point later, Isaiah 1 is an Israelite rights text, not a human rights text. And I believe that the same is true of other prophetic texts as well. Since the issue of human rights is most often discussed in relation to the UN's Universal Declaration of Human Rights, I will focus on that document. Compared to the Bible, it is short, containing a preamble and 30 articles. Still, I need to be selective and I hope that I am doing so in a fair way. My initial focus will be on slavery, 
in part because of the recent award-winning report from The Guardian and Observer in England that noted that there are approximately 30 million slaves now in the world, highlighting that this is a crucial contemporary human rights issue. The current movie, Ten Years a Slave, which I have not seen yet, has also put slavery back on our radar screen. Article 4 of the Declaration states, no one shall be held in slavery or servitude. Slavery and the slave trade shall be prohibited in all their forms. We have a problem. The Bible recognizes slavery to some extent of fellow Israelites and certainly of non-Israelites. Let me begin with Exodus 21, probably the Bible's earliest slave law. When you acquire a Hebrew slave, he shall serve you for six years. In the seventh year, he shall go free without payment. If he came single, he shall leave single. If he had a wife, his wife shall leave with him. If his master gave him a wife and she has borne him children, the wife and the children shall belong to the master and he shall leave alone. In other words, this purchased slave produces little slavelets who stay with the master. But if the slave declares, I love my master, it doesn't really mean love, you know, sort of like tolerate, and my wife and children, I do not wish to go free, his master shall take him before God, he should probably the local temple, he shall be brought to the door or the doorpost, his master shall pierce his ear, ear, not earlobe, these are not earrings, and he shall remain his slave for life. The text continues with the female law, which I'll just begin, when a man sells his daughter as a slave, let's read that again, let that sink in. When a man sells his daughter as a slave, she shall not be freed as male slaves are. Thus this law, in addition to violating Article 3, which I just read, contrasts sharply with another article, everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of person, and contravenes Article 16.2. Marriage shall be entered into only with the free and full consent of the, in of the intending spouses. It may be significant that the slave legislation in Deuteronomy 15, which reworks Exodus male and female slave laws, seems to abolish what you have in Exodus, where the father can sell his daughter into slavery. But Deuteronomy has not cleaned up all of the important issues of Exodus. For example, in terms of the laws from the UN Declaration I just, met, I just mentioned about freedom of marriage, Deuteronomy 22, 28, and 29 states, if a man comes upon a virgin who is not engaged, he seizes her and lies with her and they are discovered, the man who lay with her shall pay the girl's father 50 shekels of silver, and she shall be his wife. Because he has violated her, he can never have the right to divorce her. The girl is treated here as the father's property, the father is compensated for the lost bride price, and the girl loses any choice she might have had about a marriage partner. This is all surely problematic from a human rights perspective and violates Articles 3 and 16, which I cited above. Let me return to slavery and remind you that part of being a critical Bible scholar is realizing the variety of biblical positions and texts. Thus, it is important to note what it says in Deuteronomy 23, 16, and 17. You shall not turn over to his master a slave who seeks refuge with you from his master. He shall live with you in any place he may choose among the settlements in your midst, wherever he pleases. You must not ill treat him. Bernard Levinson observes in the Jewish Study Bible, the law rejects the almost universal stipulation with an ancient New Eastern law that escaped slaves must be returned to their owner, usually under the penalty of death, and rewards bounty hunters for their return. 
Yes, in some places, the Bible has a better human rights record than the ancient Near East. But, that's my favorite word in this talk, but. But, is it sufficient to look at the Bible human rights record relatively rather than absolutely? I think we must do both. I would like to introduce another slave law from the Composite Torah in Leviticus 25, which deals with progressive stages of poverty. I begin with verse 39, which describes the most, situa most serious situation of impoverishment. If your kinsman under you continues in straits and must give himself over to you, do not subject him to the treatment of a slave. He shall remain with you as a hired or bound laborer. He shall serve you until the jubilee year. These are cycles of every 50 years. So it's a good idea to get impoverished right before the jubilee year, not right after it. Then he and his children, contrast Exodus, shall be free of your authority. He shall go back to his family and return to his ancestral holding. For they, the Israelites, are my God's servants, whom I freed from the lands of Egypt. They must not give themselves over into servitude. You, are, you shall not rule over him ruthlessly. You shall fear your God. Well, this is much better than Exodus and even Deuteronomy. It abolishes what I call internal slavery. And it also shows that theological notions, in this case, the idea that Israel are God, is God's slave, God's servants, can have human rights, or at least Israelite rights, implication. This legislation of Leviticus finds resonance in Nehemiah, probably from the fifth pre-Christian century or so. This is one of the books in Kitzhuvim, the last section of the Hebrew Bible, or toward the end of the historical books, the second section of the Christian Bible, that people hardly read, even though it is incredibly important for understanding the development of Judaism. It is a crucial book for understanding the Bible and its development. And for that reason, I'm going to read a rather long quote from it. There was a great outcry by the common folk and their wives against their brother Jews. Some said, our sons and daughters are numerous. We must get grain so that we could live. Others said, we have to pawn our fields and everything else. Others said, we borrowed money and we can't repay it. So now we are subjecting our sons and daughters to slavery. This is death slavery. Some of our daughters are already subjected. Uh, pretty interesting. They sell their daughters before their sons. And we are powerless while our fields and vineyards belong to others. Well, Nehemiah has a fit. He's very good at having fits. He changes the situation, and the people say, we shall give them back and not demand anything of them. We shall do just as you say. But, and here's another one of my buts, neither the law in Leviticus nor what I just read in Nehemiah is deals with human rights. This is especially clear in Leviticus, since only Israelites are God's servants, according to that book. This is made certain by the following verses from Leviticus, right after the law concerning the Israelite slave or indentured servant. Such male and female slaves as you may have, it is from the nations round about that you may acquire male and female slaves. You may also buy them from the children of aliens resident among you, or from their families. These shall become your property. You may keep them as a possession for your children after you. They're inherited. For the, such, you may tr such you may treat as slaves. But as for your Israelite kinsmen, no one shall rule ruthlessly over the other. You want to be ruthless? Get non-Israelite slaves. Thus, in terms of human rights, the record of the Bible concerning slavery is highly problematic. In terms of Israelite rights, it is mixed. 
worse than Exodus, a bit better in Deuteronomy, and still better in the book of Leviticus, which seems to abolish that institution. But as the rest of that passage indicates, this is true for Israelites only, due to their special relationship between Israel and God. If I had more time, I would focus within Israel on men's versus women's rights. I would like to just note briefly here that men and women seem to have the same legal status as people. A woman who is murdered is a person, and a woman murderer is treated the same as a male murderer. Thus, the Bible is good in terms of the first part of Article 7. All are equal before the law and are entitled without any discrimination to equal protection of the law. But, and here I would like to acknowledge Professor Carol Myers for her path-breaking studies concerning women in ancient Israel. According to biblical legislation, men and women are certainly not equal in all ways. This brings me to Article 17. Everyone has the right to own property alone, as well as in association with others. Biblical Israel was highly problematic in this regard. Women could not own property, according to most biblical texts. This stands behind the Book of Ruth. So let me explain, because most people don't actually realize this. So the book opens with Nomi, happily married, actually it's the preface to the book in some sense, happily married to her husband Elimelech, living in the town of Bethlehem, which means the house of bread, where I imagine they have food, until the famine strikes. The whole family moves to Moab, and in Moab, their two children, Mahlon and Kilion, marry Moabite women, and then all of the men's folk die. Elimelech dies, the two sons-in-law die, and then the famine is over, and it's time to return to the land. And most of the Book of Ruth deals with the issue of how is Nomi going to get access to the field of her late husband, Elimelech? You would think, oh, she just can go back to Bethlehem. She knows where the field is, and she can claim the field. But now go back to the book, and you realize that the issue is she could only gain access to the field and the sustenance that it offers uh, through some sort of male relative of her late husband, the Goel, the Redeemer. Women could not own property. Some of you might raise as an objection the case of the daughters of Tzlofchad mentioned at the end of the book of Numbers. Most people don't get up to chapter 27. <laughs> I quote selectively. The daughters of Tzlofchad came forward. They stood before Moses and others and said, Our father died in the wilderness. He was not one of the faction, Korach's faction, which banded together against the Lord. In other words, he wasn't one of the really, really bad guys, but died for his own sin. That's a really interesting theology in any case. And he left no sons. Let our father's name not be lost to his clan just because he has no son. Give us a holding among our father's kinsmen, the daughters are saying. Moses is flummoxed. This is less than a handful of cases where he doesn't know what to do. He brought their case before the Lord, and the Lord said to Moses, the plea of Tzlofchad's daughter is just. You should give them a hereditary holding among their father's kinsmen, transfer their father's share to them. And if the story ended there, it would be wonderful. But a careful look at the continuation of the story makes clear that these daughters inherit exceptionally only as placeholders for one generation so that their father's name may not be lost. They must, the story continues, marry men of their own clan, and the land reverts to these men. Thus, 
women did not typically own property in ancient Israel. I would like to turn from women, perhaps one type of other from the biblical perspective, to the more clear other, foreigners. And we'd like to highlight the most problematic Israelite human rights text. Ironically, it comes from Deuteronomy, which as we have seen sometimes improves the human and Israelite rights record of earlier sources, 2016 and following. This is, this is within a context dealing with Israelites fighting wars. In the towns of the latter peoples, however, I'll be clarified in a second, which the Lord your God is giving you as heritage, you must not let a soul remain alive. Lo techaye kol neshama. No, you must proscribe them. The Hebrew phrase is hacharim tacharimeim. Cherem means to kill and dedicate to God. It is proscribe, P-R-O, not prescribe. You are not taking them to CVS, Walgreens, or Rite Aid. You are killing them. The Hittites and the Amorites, the Canaanites and the Perizzites, the Hivites and the Jebusites, as the Lord your God has commanded you, lest... It's my favorite biblical English word. Lest, you, someone was just using a, a flashcards pen, they lead you into doing all the abhorrent things that they have done for their gods, and you shall stand guilty before the Lord your God. Well, to let this sink in a little, let me give you a 21st century analogy of Deuteronomy. So, you know, in the next town over, nice town, uh, integrated in all sorts of ways. So the family, a Jewish, an observant Jewish and an observant Christian family live together. And the observant Jewish boy, Chaim Yitzchak, plays very nicely at Christina's house and vice versa, at least until early December. Then, Chris, then Chaim, Chaim Yitzchak's parents have several options. They can say, well, you know what, let's have a nice talk about Chaim, with Chaim Yitzchak about multicultural America. He will surely understand at age five what this is all about. Or yet another option is they can say, Okay, we do not really want Chaim Yitzchak playing with Christina under the Christmas tree. And therefore, from December 1st till the first garbage pickup after <laughs> January 1st, when the Christmas tree is going to go, uh, Chaim Yitzchak and Christina are going to play very nicely at our house. Option number three, Deuteronomy 20, this can create a real problem. Let's burn down Christina's house. <laughs> it's actually not funny. So in case cheremin, or to use the English term, proscribing or banning the Canaanites, is not an obvious human rights violation, I cite Article 18. Everyone has the right of freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. This includes freedom to change religion or belief, and so forth. I can make this a little bit better. Uh, from the rabbinic point of view, this law no longer existed because the rabbis claimed that these six Canaanite nations who uh, are noted in Deuteronomy chapter 20 can no longer be identified. The late biblical scholar Moshe Greenberg, who wrote about this a lot, and is actually talked about a little bit in the Duke 40th Anniversary Magazine and Jewish Studies that just came out, claims that this was a theoretical law. In other words, that it was never really applied and was written in the book of Deuteronomy also, as the rabbis claim, after these nations no longer exist. As a critical scholar, 
I would say that this law only, only, but only appears in one of the four main sources of the Torah. But still, it is there, and the book of Joshua describes how it was applied against the city of Jericho, and the book of Samuel also describes how it was applied against the Amalekites. Thus, I can only use the word horrific to describe this law. But, and this is typical of critical or contextual biblical studies, there are other biblical voices as well. Some of you might be thinking, oh, when is he finally going to talk about Leviticus 19.18? V'yahavta l'reacha kamocha. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But that verse is not so simple. So I need to start with grammar. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. How does as yourself function? Is it adverbial? Does it mean you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself, which is probably how most of you took it until this very moment? Or is it ad nominal? And does it mean you shall love your neighbor who is like yourself? In other words, your fellow Israelites. Now, I will just say that the Bible, biblical Hebrew, allows both interpretations. So what do we do? Well, the most important determinator, to my mind, of what something means in the Bible is the broader context in which it is found. So since that verse is Leviticus 19.18, let me begin with 19.16, emphasizing a few words in the preceding verses. Do not deal basely with your countrymen. Do not profit by the blood of your fellow. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your kinsfolk in your heart. Reprove your kinsmen, but incur no guilt because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against your countrymen. Now, love your fellow as yourself. I am the Lord. Thus, 1918, based on the context and the other synonyms to like yourself, countrymen, fellow kinsfolk, kinsmen, suggests that this law in its original context only refers to the ancient Israelites. But keep reading the chapter. Verses 33 to 34 of Leviticus 19 note, when a stranger, here the Hebrew word is ger, which in rabbinic Hebrew means a convert. It never has that meaning in biblical Hebrew. It's always a stranger, someone not of your own ethnicity and religious group. Those two notions were very tightly connected in the ancient world throughout all of my period. And what this is really dealing with is somebody who's living in your territory uh, temporarily, as far as we know. You know. It's not like ancient Israel was, you know, Durham, and everybody would come to Durham to retire, even if you're not from there. So people would, from other ethnic groups and religions, might reside temporarily with you, but there were not mass movements the way there are now. So when a gare, a stranger, resides with you in your land, you shall not wrong him. The stranger who resides with you shall be as one of your citizens. You shall love him as yourself, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So human rights and foreigners depend on which Torah source we are discussing. Let me move from specific biblical laws to certain principles that may be articulated in the Bible, or more specifically, in some strands of the Bible. The first is again pointed out by Moshe Greenberg, who claims that a postulate of biblical law is already referred to in the first creation story in Genesis 1.27. It's so beautiful, I need to read it in Hebrew. Vayivra Adonai ta'adam b'tzalmo, b'tzalem Elohim bara oto, zachar unekeva bara otam. 
case you didn't notice, it's poetry. God created person in his image. In the image of God did he create it. Male and female did he create them. And Greenberg points out the related verse in 9-6, which you also have to listen to in poetry, because it is the best Hebrew example of what is called a chiasm, an A, B, C, C, B, A structure. It's a chiasm is a fancier word for palindrome. Shofech dam ha I'll read the beginning twice so you can hear it. Shofech dam ha adam ba adam damo yishafech. Shofech dam ha adam ba adam damo yishafech. Ki b'tzelem Elohim asa et ha adam. And I'm going to give you two slightly different translations, but the difference is significant, though I'm not going to get to it. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For in, the, in his image did God make man. Or, whoever now sheds human blood, for that human blood shall his blood be shed. The earlier translation was by man. This is, for that human blood shall his blood be shed. For in God's image he made humankind. This is a human rights, not just an Israelite rights principle. After all, it precedes the choosing of Abraham and concerns all people. It is close to the preamble of the UN Declaration and Article 1, which suggests all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. Here is another general human rights principle found in the Bible. In a tantalizing book, Inventing Human Rights, A History, Lynn Hunt, a distinguished historian from UCLA, suggests that new ideas concerning empathy were responsible for human, the human rights boon in the 18th century, and even connects human rights and empathy to the development of the novel in that period. Because in the novel, you get to understand the other in a sympathetic way. In relation to this, I'd like to point to three legal traditions which cut across the three large legal corpora within the Hebrew Bible, all of which emphasize empathy. Exodus. You shall not wrong a stranger or oppress him, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Leviticus, we saw this. The stranger who resides with you shall be like one of your citizens. Love him as yourself, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Deuteronomy, you too must befriend the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Unfortunately, this principle of empathy was not always carried out in ancient Israelite legislation. We saw this most clearly by the fact that all biblical legislation allows Israelites to take non-Israelites as slaves, and in Deuteronomy's cherem law. But it is important to note that the, in, the empathic principle does exist, even if it is not well implemented. Biblical books usually end on a positive note. I would like to follow their example. Article 24 reads, everyone has the right to rest and leisure, including reasonable limitation of working hours and periodic holidays with pay. Here, the biblical legislation concerning the Shabbat, the Sabbath, is relevant. There are very few places where I can say the Bible is unique and completely distinctive vis-a-vis -vis its neighbors but the Shabbat is one of these. No other ancient Near Eastern culture has a day of complete rest. And what is more relevant, that day of rest according to the Bible is for everyone living as Israel, everyone living in Israel, as, for example, the Decalogue, the so-called Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy make clear. But the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. You, your sons or your daughter, your male and female slave, 
your ox, your ass, any of your cattle, or the stranger, here comes the gare, in your settlements, so that your male and female slave may rest as you do. Remember that you are a slave in the land of Egypt. Empathy. And the Lord your God freed you there, etc. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. So here is a remarkable case where the Bible anticipates human rights. I do not believe that it counters or compensates for the problematic cases, but it is nevertheless worthy of attention, especially since it is uniquely biblical. Let me cite another such set of cases related to Article 25.1 of the UN Declaration and directly relevant to current events. Everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for health and well-being of himself and his family, including food, clothing, housing, and medical care, and necessary social services, and the right to security in the event of unemployment, sickness, disability, widowhood, old age, or other lack of livelihood in circumstances beyond his control. Here, too, the Bible has an especially good record that is unique in the ancient Near East. I am referring to the laws related to gleaning and other matters that are found in Leviticus and Deuteronomy and that serve as the basis for the middle of the book of Ruth. Leviticus 19.9, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap all the way to the edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. You shall not pick your vineyard bare or gather the fallen fruit of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the stranger, the gare. I am the Lord, your God. This law is so important that Leviticus repeats it several chapters later, after the Shavuot festival, when it was seasonally most appropriate. The late Jacob Milgram, the Leviticus expert, polemicizing against the idea that only the prophets cared, reminds us, I quote, it should not be forgotten that concerns for the underprivileged, the poor, the widow, the orphan, the alien, is consistently reiterated throughout scripture. The, prophet, the prophets repeatedly railed against neglect and exploitation. That's a bit of an exaggeration. What is sometimes forgotten is that concern for the exploited is equally characteristic of the Torah literature in all its sources. Similarly, Deuteronomy 24, perhaps the source for Leviticus, notes, when you reap the harvest in your field and overlook a sheaf in the field, do not go back and get it. It shall go to the stranger, the gare, the fatherless, and the widow, in order that the Lord your God may bless you in all your undertakings. When you beat down the fruit of your olive trees, do not go over them again. This is really, I've actually seen this. This is the way you get olives off trees. You take big sticks, you beat, and you only get no do-overs. You get to do it only once. Why? That, that shall go what remains on the tree to the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. Similarly for the grapevine, and remember that you are slaves in Egypt. Therefore, do I enjoin you to observe this commandment, empathy and human rights. These pieces of legislation are, as one commentator puts it, not voluntary almsgiving, but recognize, as does the UN Declaration, the special needs of the needy. I would like to repeat what I said earlier. This is unique legislation. But since I am a biblical scholar who likes to hear the many different voices of the Bible, we cannot generalize from these wonderful passages to the entire Hebrew Bible and I continue to say, sadly but honestly, that the biblical human rights record is mixed. Before concluding, I'd like to return to the book of Amos, which I began with. It's the verse quoted by Martin Luther King. Earlier I claimed that its call in chapter five for justice was addressed toward an internal Israelite audience 
and it is thus really related to Israelite rights, not human rights. In fairness, I'd like to note now that this is counterbalanced by a clear human rights 